I'm reading from Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. Almost unbelievable words from the mouth of the Lord Jesus. Notice he said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Then there was a certain baker named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table more of the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the baker died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom or into paradise or into Hades or into the unseen world easy to understand into heaven. Now pick up the story. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and see of Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this roaring flame. It says in the Greek language, Look up from your Bibles. This is the story of two beggars. One that begged in this life and one that begged in the afterlife. This is a story about an unsaved soul that went to a place called hell where there is real flame, where he suffered the pain of flame even as you suffered here on earth. Dr. Joseph Cook, one of the great intellects of the past, had this to say, let the churches banish from their pulpits the doctrine of hell for a hundred years, it'll come right back. For not only is it a cardinal doctrine in the Bible, but it's in the very nature of things. For every person must be either pardoned or punished. 260 chapters, or rather 262 chapters in the New Testament, and 234 of them teach about a place called hell. Now I believe for a reason. Jesus taught much about heaven. He talked about the second coming. He talked about the resurrection. He talked about all the doctrines. But he taught ten times more about hell than he did heaven. I believe for a reason. You do. I believe that Jesus taught ten times more about hell than he did heaven because he didn't want anyone to go there. You have scripture proof for that? Yes, I do. In Matthew 25, 41. Then he shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil, his angels, and God does not want you to go to hell. If you go to hell, you'll stumble over the prayers of countless thousands of people the world over. Because God doesn't want you to go to hell. In fact, in 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. God doesn't want you to go to hell. To God for you. But God doesn't want you to go to hell. In fact, in John 3, 17, the Bible says, God sent not his Son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God does not want you to go to hell. If you go to hell, you'll have to stumble over the blood-stained body of the lovely Lord Jesus. But God does not want you to go to hell. In fact, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, watch, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God does not want you to go to hell. But because there is so much scripture, page after page, not only in the New Testament, but in the Old, because there is so much scripture in the Bible about a place called hell, I want you tonight to take a walk with me down through the halls of hell. Begin the descent. Downward. As we move along, I want you to see carefully that first of all, it's a place of perpetual horror. I say that for three reasons, and here's the first one. Because of the torment of toilsome chains. Chains, yes, in Jude 6. And the angels that kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, have they reserved in everlasting chains. One of the first 
places I ever preached when I went away to school to study for the ministry was in a chain gang. I preached there, oh, I suppose six weeks. Finally, the jailer got the idea he could trust us. He'd let us go in and sit on the bedside and talk to those prisoners on Sunday afternoon. One Sunday afternoon, I was talking to a prisoner who had been marvelously saved, who, by the way, is now preaching. He said, you know, Brother Shunk, since I got saved, this old hard pet here is beginning to feel soft. And I don't mind the 14 hours we've got to work every day, and even the bad food here is beginning to taste good. But there's one thing that really bugs me. What's that? He said, see that long chain that runs the length of this barracks? I see it. So you see that little chain down here with a clamp on the end of it? Yes. He said, at night, they put that clamp around my ankle and chained me to this bed, and that really bugs me. And I thought, oh, God, to be chained in hell forever. For in 2 Peter 2, 4, God spared not the angels in sin, but cast them down into hell, and hath delivered them into everlasting chains. Ever been in that position? I mean, where you couldn't move around much. Back in World War II, I fired a machine gun for some two and a half years over the top of those Italian hills, and one day we pushed up the side of a mountain. They said, dig in. I'll tell you, when they said dig in, we dug. Down through the rocks and everything. Sometimes ten or twelve foxholes a day until the blood ran out of your hands. We dug halfway in, and suddenly the mortars came over the top of the hill, and we got down as low as we could, but you, you couldn't get clear down without bending, and we did that. 20 hours. You could move from this side or to the other side, but you couldn't straighten up. Finally, the platoon came over here, another platoon here, and knocked out that mortar barrage, and we were able to get out of those holes. I was a young man then, but it took me nearly two hours to straighten completely up straight. Wait a minute. You say the torment of toilsome change, but I want you to see the torment of total darkness. What the Bible teaches in Jude 13. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. Oh, it's different here on earth. If you sit tonight under the sound of my voice, and your heart and life are not dominated by the Lord Jesus Christ, then I know what you do. You stumble off the world to try to find some kind of freedom from your terrible frustration. Maybe you wander into the arms of some degenerated lover. Or into some darkened bar to try to drink yourself into oblivion. No. Sleep won't come at night and you go to the drug cabinet and take some kind of drug that puts you in a beautiful sleep. But when you go to hell, you'll never sleep again. Or take another drink or dance another step. And the only arms you ever feel will be the arms of fire. Look, the Bible teaches in 2 Peter 2.17, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried out without a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Dr. Jack Kyle said he and his wife went down into the cave of winds. Now that's the deepest cave in the Americas. When they got down there, he said, now our, the speaker came on and said, now we're going to take a hold of hands. We're going to turn out the lights and let you experience total dark. Now please take a hold of hands because it's frightening. So he said we did. And the lights went out. Now a moment he said, out. Oh. Pick up my wife's silhouette, couldn't, couldn't see her. I struggled to get my hand loose, but did. I said, I'll see my hand and couldn't see it. Put my fingers up in front of my eyes, but couldn't see them. No wonder then in Matthew 8, 12, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weaving and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness. You know what that really means? Here's a man at a gay party where music bounces to jeweled chandelier and back down to the cup where the wine is being poured. <laughs> Laughter is gay when suddenly two strong armed guards come in from a side room and grab this man and take him forcibly out into the desert, down into a dungeon there, they chain him to the wall and leave him until his body dies and the flesh rots off his bones. And that's exactly what the author is trying to teach when he calls it outer darkness. 
It's a place of perpetual darkness. It's a place where there's a torment of toilsome change. And I want you to see this. It's a place of perpetual horror because of the torment of turbulent memories. For here, in Luke 12, 4 and 5, the Bible says, But I have forewarned you whom you shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. I remember some years ago I read those two verses and I believed that God reached down with the holy hand and took a hold of the lid to the pit of hell and lifted it up and let me look down inside into hell. I saw a great river of fire. You could hardly see from one side to the other. It moved along endlessly. The scream so loud that you couldn't hear yourself think. It would move along and bounce against great piles of brimstone, and that fire would dance a thousand feet into the air, playing grotesque shadows against the walls of hell. Maybe when that flame dashed in the air, some terrible demon from hell jumps up on a pile of brimstone and begins to cackle. I forewarn you. I can almost hear it. I forewarn you. Echoing down the halls of hell and coming back to, to beat against your eardrums forever, and you'll remember. For in Luke 16, 25, what Abraham said, Son, remember that thou thy lifetime received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. Oh, you'll remember, all right. You will remember right now as I pulled across your memory pattern. The Christmas dinner and the whole family's there. Smile. You've had a steak dinner with the friends that you love. You've mowed the lawn. It's 90 degrees. The wife meets you with a glass of ice water at the door. But when you go to hell, it'll be the end of the ice. And no more mother's smiles or the feel of anything but fire around your neck. And you've got to be a fool if you go to hell and not come to Christ. The Bible teaches in Isaiah 57, 20, But the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. There's no rest, said the Lord of the wicked. I tell you that hell is a place of perpetual horror. But take the steps that are necessary as we go on downward and walking through the halls of hell. I want you to see, second of all, it's a place of perpetual fire. That's F-I-R-E. For here in Isaiah 30, in verse 33, the Bible says, For hell is ordained of old, and God hath made it deep and large, and the pile thereof is fire and much wood, and the breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. That's not the Baptist idea, nor the Methodist. That's Bible, clear and simple. Uh, Joe Henry Hankins, does that ring a bell? They used to call him the weeping prophet. He lived to be way past 80. I believe he preached even when he was in his 80s. But when he was a little boy, he went uptown, they were building a huge building, and he wanted to see that. They finished the foundation, pushed the debris in the middle of that. Some careless workman poured gasoline on top of that and threw a match. That explosion picked up little Joe Henry Hanks, put him clear across the road, 90% of his body burned. They picked him up, rushed him to the hospital, and put him in a hammock affair because his body couldn't stand the clothing. The family was called. Mother was by the hammock. The doctor comes out the door and said, you better go in, all the will. He's not got but about 10 minutes. The family in the room, he went deeper and deeper into that coma. When all of a sudden something snapped, he started out of the coma, then the feelings came into his body. He tried to scream. Then the coma started to take over again. He started to go into it. And he said, Mother, what, what time is it? She said, Joe, it's 10 o'clock at night. Weeping. Then he said this. Mother, won't the night ever end? It ended for Joe Henry Hankins. And God brought him back alive. Scarred, but to preach the gospel until he is past 80. But when you go to hell, you will feel every second of pain that Joe Henry Hankins felt in its intensity. Forever and ever. It 
if you've got to be a fool if you go to hell and not come to Christ. In Luke 16, 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this roaring flame. Flame? Put your finger over a flame for 30 seconds. I can't. Three seconds. No! When you go to hell, you'll be engulfed in flame with no relief in sight for all eternity. The Bible teaches in Matthew 13, 42, And God shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Furnace. Here's a man that has a congregation of 2,000 preachers in England. One day, he goes down to visit one of his parishioners who owns a great glass factory. He's not here, so he leaves. Here comes the vice president. Watch it now, tripping up behind him. Wait a minute, sir. He said, Pastor, uh, the boss will be back in ten minutes. Have you ever seen one of our great glass furnaces in action? Never have. Follow me. Down the long, long walk to the king, two huge black doors, and the vice president reaches over and opens those two black doors, and just as he does, the man attending that furnace opens the door, and the blue and yellow flames dart clear to the top of the furnace. The pastor, shielding himself from that heat, said, Dear God, what must hell be like? He stood Sunday morning to preach to 2,000 people. He hadn't preached for two minutes when a great big 220 pound man came running all the way down the front of the church. My good man, what means this? Oh, he said, Preacher, you don't know who I am, but I know who you are. I was the man telling that furnace, and I heard you say, Dear God, what must hell be like? And after you left, I said, God, if hell's like the inside that furnace, I'm not going to go there. And if you let me get down to church Sunday morning, I'll be the first one saved. The preacher stopped the whole service and knelt down on that carpeted floor and let that man, the Lord Jesus, go oh, look here, in Jude 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and cities round about them, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. You know what that means? Homosexuality. I understand the latest figures in America are 25 million homosexuals. Look up here at me. If that exists in your body, you have any towards that. Are you ever have practiced that? When you go before God, you will get stuffed into hell. Unless you've taken care of that here on earth through the Lord Jesus Christ. What about it? Even in Sodom and Gomorrah and cities round about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, hath God set forth to be an example, suffering the vengeance of an eternal fire. Suppose the bird could pick up a grain of sand and take it to the moon and come back and get another one and so forth. And if the whole world were made of nothing but sand by the time the bird got all the sand of the moon, eternity would not yet be beginning. Now listen. In Isaiah 33, 14, Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning? See the bomb bay doors open up. A bomb drops big enough for you to carry if you're strong enough and misses the target by 200 yards. When that bomb burst, 100,000 Japanese people, Japanese people died. Some didn't because it burst out in fingers and behind hills and mountains. Some of those holes even were protected. One man who lived behind a great hill a great bridge out in front of him stood on his porch in complete shock. He could move not a muscle except his eyes. He said suddenly, as he had stood there for many hours, he heard something up on top of the hill yelling. And he looked up, and over the top of the hill came hundreds of colored people. And he said, not only have I... Am I in shock, but I've lost my mind. There are no colored people in Japan. Down the hill they come. Some would fall, and others would trample them to death. Some got to the bridge and stood on the bridge and cursed, and jumped in the water, committing suicide. Oh, he said, it's when they cursed that I came out of my shock. These weren't black people. They were my old Japanese people, charred black by that terrible bomb. And if you miss all the other hundreds 
misdeeds found in Mark 9, 43. Jesus said, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. For it's better for you to enter life maimed than having two hands to go into hell's fire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The fire is not quenched. The fire is not quenched. Back in World War II, we, had, we were pushing through a great wooded area. Our command was to go at almost double time. We had to come out to an open area where there was a great grass field. And then over here was Hill 216. We had to get that and secure it. We came out of that woods on the run. We scattered down along that grass and headed across that great grass area when suddenly a machine gun firing from cement and steel opened fire on us. We headed for the ditch. You stick your head up and he'd blow it off the machine gun. We stayed down in the ditch, but I knew it wouldn't be long till they called for the mortars and they green the mortars in that ditch and kill every one of us. When I saw our man get on the phone and call back for the flame thrower, I'd never seen one really in action. I saw that man come crawling up behind a rock. He got that nozzle placed right at that machine gun nest. And at the right time, he pulled the trigger. The plane dashed up and right on that machine gun nest. And all you heard was, Ah! In absolute silence. Nobody moved a muscle. It seemed like an hour. Finally, the lieutenant said, Go. And we rushed up the side of that hill, everybody running, and the hot tears were coming down my face. And I said, God, as long as I live, I'm never going to preach on hell. If it's like inside there, I can't preach it. It's too horrible. I'll not do it, God. And down through the years, God's had to whip me around good and proper to get me to preach on the doctrine of hell. I tell you, it's a place of perpetual horror, a place of perpetual fire. Stop. Go down these steps with me deeper. Oh, I know it's hot. Come on. As we walk through the halls of hell, I want you to see that it's a place of perpetual punishment. What's that mean? In Matthew 25, 46, and these shall go away to everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal. Everlasting. I preached in the Greek penitentiary. 600 men sat out there. Some of them were doctors and lawyers. I gave the invitation to 100 men responded. I had to deal with them with about 20 here and then 13 here and maybe 24 over here in little bunches. It took me nearly three hours. Unbeknownst to me, the warden was watching me three floors up above through a little slit. He sat for me. I went through that door and he asked me to sit down. Before he left, he went to speak to me and couldn't do it. Tried again. Then all of a sudden he buried his face in his hand and began to weep. He said, Brother Sean, after a while, he said, several of the guards and myself had been praying that God send revival in this penitentiary, and we believe today it's come. We talked, and the orderly brought some coffee, and I said, Warden, with whom do you have the most trouble with in this great penitentiary? Oh, he said, that's easy. It's the lifers. The lifers? Oh, yes. He said, you see, they get in here a couple of years, then they realize they're going to be here forever. They're always dreaming up some new way to commit suicide. But there'll be no suicide in hell. You cry for rocks and mountains. The screaming will be so loud you can't make yourself heard. You beg God, but there's no help. Look at here. In 2 Thessalonians 1 9, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction. In case you thought that death ended it all, or somehow you can get out of hell, this destroys it. You know what that means in the Greek? Everlasting destruction. Run to a pit of destruction and never cast over. Well, there's such excruciating torment it can't be fully scratching and turning and twisting and pulling to get one finger out of the fires of hell for five seconds. 
your best friend will be right next to you. There'll be no such thing as friendship. You'll never be alone with that. There'll be no comments in hell.
and came back and fell across the bottom of that bed and wept, wept to the last thing that godly lady did that day before she died was lead her to the youngest son, Jesus Christ. Listen, don't go to hell. 